today, I want to take and spend some time concluding our series on Back to the Basics. Now, this is not the end of being Back to the Basics. I want you to understand that. The, the concept that God laid in my heart to go back to the basics is a year-long commitment. All year this year, we're going to be talking about the basics. We're, 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 we're reading the Bible. We're talking about our doctrine. We're talking about what we believe in. And, and, and by the end of this year, we will, have, we will have went through the entire Bible on Wednesday nights. On Sunday nights, we will have preached through our declaration of faith and our doctrinal commitments as the church of God. And, and we're going to look at our, our core doctrine on Sunday nights. On Sunday mornings by the end of the year, uh, first series is going to come up, I believe it's in March. Uh, we're going to be doing seven series on what the Church of God calls our practical commitments, which are those things that we believe in practical everyday life help us live according to our doctrine. And, and so by the end of this year, we're going to go back to the basics of what we really believe as a church. And, and so... We've just started this month. We've started this year with this month of, hey, let's remember what it means to go back to the basics. And, and we, talked about, we talked about the presence of God. And we talked about how that we needed God's presence in our, in our word. We talked about the word of God, or, or if I could, I should have called it the precepts of God. Because everything else sort of starts with P. But anyway, but we, 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 we talked about the Word of God and how we've got to have the Word of God. Last week we talked about prayer and how that we've got to have prayer. And prayer has got to be a part of our daily life. And today we're going to talk about purpose. Now, i, I got to be honest with you. Uh, uh, Brother Don sort of said it when I talked to the kids. Uh, as I was putting this sermon together, I thought, God, I, I talk about this a lot. And God said, that's because it's your purpose. Our purpose has to be the forefront of our mind. Oh, a little over a year ago now, almost two years ago, I think, we had our purpose painted onto our front wall. I purposely did not want this put up in banners. I didn't want it put up on paper. I wanted it painted. Why? Because our purpose needs to hold steady. We need to hold steady what our purpose is. And the purpose that we have for our church is to love God, to live like Jesus, to follow the Holy Spirit, and to serve the world. Love, live, follow, and serve. Pastor, what do you mean by that? I mean that that should drive everything we do. Everything we do should be about loving God, living like Jesus, following the Holy Spirit, and serving the world. When, when we look at our worship services... We love God with worship. We love, I, I, I sat down as we were just starting our, 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 our mission statement and our purpose statement. I sat down and began to think about love. And I'm going to get to the message in a second. This is all free. And, and I'm not going to charge you for this. And, and, and I began to think about love. And, and one of the greatest books on love I've ever, I've ever read was a book by Dr. Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. If you're married or ever want to be married, you should read that book. Uh, me and my wife read that book about five or seven years after we got married, and it changed our marriage. Uh, the, the five love language concept says that everybody speaks of love language, and there's five basic ones. And if you and your spouse don't speak the same love language, sometimes you struggle. It would be like you marrying somebody who spoke another language. And, and you don't know exactly what they're saying. And I found out that most couples don't speak the same love language. Me and my wife don't speak any of the same love languages. Her love languages are not mine, and mine are not hers. And, and, and there, are, there are five basic ones. Words of affirmation, quality time, touch, um, um, gifts, and I'm probably missing one of the best. Ser serving, yeah. And, and, and acts of service. And, and those are the five basic love languages. And yes, that was best main love language that I forgot. That's just going to go over well. Um, and, and, and as I begin to think about those love languages and we talk about loving God, I looked at our morning worship services. And we endeavor to express all five love languages 
every Sunday. We, we spend quality time. We come together. Quality time with God, seeking God. We, we acts of service, we give and tithe and offerings, and we, and we do ministries and we do things. We give our, of our talents and our gifts. Um, words of affirmation, we sing songs that praise God. We affirm him. Uh, gifts, again, is giving and the offering. Um, and, and I forgot another one, but I had laid it out where we had all five love languages. Why? Because I want that to be part of who we are. I want us loving God on a real basis. Living like Jesus. Living like Jesus is one of the big things that I push all the time. Because over and over, you've heard me say, especially lately, we can't do this here. We got to do this out there. We have got to find ways to look like Christ at Walmart and to look like Christ at, at school and to look like Christ at work. We have got to find ways to live like Jesus outside our, our, our church house. Talk about following the Holy Spirit. Following the Holy Spirit means that we're obedient. I think it's obvious in our church that the Holy Spirit has control of our services. And when the Holy Spirit wants to change a message, we change a message. If the Holy Spirit wants to interrupt a service, we, we let him. Why? He's in charge. We follow him. Serving the world. That's one I think we need to keep working on. Because one of the problems of the American church is we want to be served. Mm. I, I, I like going to that church because they do this, this, this for me. Well, we need to start looking at church because we do this, this, and this for somebody else. We need to start changing our mindset. I've been telling you over and over and over again. We were talking about, I was talking with this, several people about this this week. I, 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 the, God has laid on my heart to quit worrying about putting people in seats and start worrying about putting God in people. You know what that means? That means that I start serving. I start being an example of service. Now, I, I've given you a quick overview of, of, of what our mission statement, what our purpose is. But if we're going to go back to the basics, we've got to constantly be coming back to this love, live, follow, and serve concept from this body of believers. Because it is our purpose. Being back to the basics is important. We've been reading this every week. If you'll open your Bibles with me. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1, says this. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, these things say, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have preserved and have patience, and have labored in my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come quickly and remove from your and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I come to you right now. And Lord, I pray that you would allow us never to walk away from our purpose, never to walk away from the meaning that you put into our life. Lord Jesus, direct our steps, direct our words, and direct our heart. Lord Jesus, I want you to open up my heart and open up my mouth and speak through me today. Lord, get me out of the way and let your word pierce into the very heart of everyone who hears this, whether it be here in this room or whether it be through podcast or video. Lord, let them hear your word and your power. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. As I began to think about back to the basics, and I began to think about this passage of Scripture, it says, you've done all these things well, but this I have against you. You've left your first love. 
go back and repent and do the first works over. Can any of you remember when you got saved? You remember what it did to your life? You remember being excited, wanting to help people? Wanting to tell everybody? Oh, I, I'm telling you, there comes a place where you get so excited, you, and where you go, to, ah, you got to know what God did. When God blesses me, man, I, I want to tell people. I've come by here today to tell you, God sees all the good stuff we've done. God sees all the good things we've done. But he also sees that we've gotten weary and well-doing. We've gotten, uh, let, let's be honest, we've gotten lazy. Well, I don't need to tell anybody. That's why we pay the preacher the big bucks. I'm just going to sit right here and let him preach to me. And I'm going to go home and figure out what he didn't say right. Some of us spend more time mm, telling people what went wrong at church than what went right at church. I got news for you folks. That's a sin. I, I, I got news for you. Rem remember, I'm not worried about putting people in seats anymore. I'm worried about putting God in people. And if all you want to do is tear things down, there's a door back there you can go out. Ooh, pastor, that ain't nice. I don't care. I, I am tired of seeing people who have lost sight of what God can do in their life. And it's high time that we stand up as a body of believers and we say, look, we've got a purpose and the purpose is not to make us happy. The purpose is to love God, live like Jesus, follow the Holy Spirit, and serve the world. If it's not doing that, we don't need it. Come on now. It's not fun preaching, but it's real preaching. When we come back to the basics, we got to come back to a place where we put God first. Where we understand that it is God's call that made us who we are. It's God's call that made us what? gave us a hope and gave us a future. So we have to start thinking about purpose. We have to start thinking about what God has laid on our hearts. I'm going to encourage you, every one of you need to have a personal purpose. You need to sit down and pray. What is your purpose? What is it that you want to do? What is it that you're seeking? But as a church, we have a purpose. That purpose is to love God, live like Jesus, follow the Holy Spirit, and serve the world. Everything we do needs to fall into that. When somebody asks you what your church is about, you should be able to tell them, we're about loving God, living like Jesus, following the Holy Spirit, and serving the world. If you want to shorten it, we're about loving, living, following, and serving. That's, that's why we're here. That's why God placed Souls Harbor Church in Chillicothe is so that we can reach this city with love, with examples of living, with, with following the Holy Spirit and with serving the world. That's why we're here. So what does that mean? First thing that's in our mission statement, our, our purpose statement, is to love God. Matthew chapter 22 verse 37 says it this way. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Jesus has been asked, what's the greatest, te the greatest commandment? And he says to him, you shall love the Lord your God. Now, if he stopped there, we can love God. But here's what he says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. You know what that means? You've got to love the Lord your God so much that everybody else is just squeezed in. In one place, they come and said, your mother and your brothers are waiting on you. And he goes, who are my mothers? And who, are, who, are, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? I tell you the truth, unless you love God and hate them. What? Are we supposed to hate our family? No, but we're supposed to love God so much that our family is a distant second. We've messed this up in America, folks. You want to know why our families are falling apart? Because we've put them in the place of God. You want to know why we struggle with our families? Because we've made our families more important than God. 
God can't bless that. The Bible says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's not about being part. Man, it drives me crazy. People have God as part of their life. Well, God's part of who I am. No, he should be all of who you are. With all your heart, with all your soul. That inner being of you. That, that, that deep place in your life. All of that belongs to God too. And all your mind. We get our minds so wrapped up in other things that we forget to love God. When we let loving God become all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind, can I tell you a little secret? Life gets easy. Because you quit worrying about everything else. You know what I figured out? When I learned to truly love God, this is going to come across harsh, and I don't mean it to. You can't control my life. Whether you like me or not, not a big deal. Now, for me to say that's a big deal, because I love people, and I think people should love me. And I worry when somebody doesn't like me. Oh, I don't. But when I truly start to love God, then I begin to understand that God is the source of my strength. He's the source of my acceptance. He's the source of my identity. He's the source of everything I have. And I don't have to worry about whether or not you like me now because I love him. And in a minute we're going to talk about living like Jesus. I'm going to love you. we got to start with loving God. We cannot live like Jesus or follow the Holy Spirit or serve the world if we don't love God. Because without loving God, we start trying to live according to rules and regulations. That's how we decide to follow Jesus. How, how, the, the way we live like Jesus is we read the Bible and we go, oh, well, Jesus did this, so i got to do this. No, that's not what it's about. When we love God, then living like Jesus becomes natural. When we love God, following the Holy Spirit becomes natural because the love drives us and guides us. When we love God, serving the world, it's a byproduct because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love gives us a picture of service. So it has to start with loving God. And we've got to love God with all. Not part. Not some. Not God, give me my little time just to be me. No, all of me. All of my mind. All of my heart. All of my soul. Everything about me, God, is about you. Because I love you more than I love anything else. We got to, next one is to live like Jesus. Once we're loving God, once God is everything, and we love him, we begin to live like Jesus. Luke chapter 14, when we begin reading verse number 27, it says, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not set down first and count the cost? whether he has enough to finish it. Pastor, what are you talking about that verse for and live like Jesus? This is what Jesus said. I'm going to bear a cross. I'm going to pay a price for you, and if you want to follow me, you have to bear your cross. you got a job to do. You got a responsibility to do. This is not, this is not buy a ticket and let somebody else do the work. The American church has become one of the most lazy churches in the world because we sit back and we want somebody else to do the praying. We want somebody else to do the singing. We want somebody else to worship. We want somebody else to testify. We want somebody else to witness. We want somebody else to invite people to church. Mm -mm. Unless you bear your cross and come after Christ, you cannot 
be his disciple. Look at that phrase. I, I, I love looking at these absolute words. I, I, I say, I, I've said for years I'm going to preach a series one of these days on the absolutes of Christ. Because all through the Bible, everybody tells me, never say never. Jesus said never. You say words like, you cannot do it. Guess what? They tell us not to say those kind of things. Because somebody can. According to Jesus, unless you carry your load, unless you sacrifice enough to understand it's not about you, living like Jesus is all about, Father, if this cup could pass from me, let it. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. See, that's living like Christ. That's living like Jesus. That, that's, that's quit worrying about what makes you feel good. Quit worrying about what gives you a tingle. Quit worrying about what makes you comfortable. And start worrying about what God wants you to do. And when you bear that cross, you become a disciple. You can become a student of Christ. How are you going to live like Jesus? By becoming a student of Jesus. But I threw that next verse in there. I could have just put verse 27. But I thought verse 28 was important. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Can I tell you? We have got to understand that this is a long-term game. Our life in the realm of eternity is a small part. But right now to us, it's everything. And when we give that all to God, we're setting down and we're counting the cost. Little secret, serving God is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you some friends. It's going to cost you some comfort. It's going to cost you getting out and doing things you didn't think you could do. It's going to cost you some embarrassment. As we get closer and closer to the return of Christ, it's going to cost you persecution. It may cost you your life. Pastor, what, what if I don't think I can pay it? Then go back to the first step. Love God. Because when you love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, then you look at living like Christ. And you go, wait a minute. You mean I've got to give up this? I can do that because I love God. You see how these things start to tie together? I, I can do that because I love God. I can live like Christ. I can count the cost. I know that somebody's not going to like me. I know that everybody's not going to agree with me. A little over a year ago, we offered a class here called Financial Peace University from Dave Ramsey. And about 12 couples went through it. And one of the things that Dave Ramsey talks about often is that when you really sell out to his program, you're going to have friends and family members going to say, man, you're crazy. You're insane. Man, I've sold out to his program. And some people look at me and go, man, wh why do you do that? Because I want to get debt free. And, and, and for, for me to do that, I, I've got to change the way I live. i got to do things differently. i gotta, I got to buy most of my clothes at Goodwill. You know what? I get some nice clothes at Goodwill. Or Facebook auctions. I get some nice ones there too. And, and I, I, you know, I do things differently than I used to do. Man, I remember the time when, when you know, if you were going to get a bottle of ketchup for me to put on my hamburger, it better be Heinz or I wouldn't eat it. I found out that store brand's a whole lot cheaper and tastes just as good. I'm not sure that there's a name brand anywhere in our kitchen right now. Why? Because, because we're committed. We've been committed for a year. 
and we paid off one credit card so far. That's it. And I'm going, but you know what? If I'll stay committed by this time next year, I will have no credit card debt. Now, why do I bring that up into the thing? Because I sat down a year ago and counted the cost. This is what it's going to take me to get where I want to be financially. Have we done that spiritually? Have we sat down and said, God, I love you enough that I give you everything. Not my will but your will be done. And when I have counted that cost, then I can move from loving God to living like Jesus because now it's not about me anymore. It's about him. Where do we go from there? Then we begin to follow the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 12, beginning verse number 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Pastor, that verse doesn't say nothing about following the Holy Spirit. Yes, it does. Let me, let me tell you something here. When we love God enough to say, I'm going to live like Jesus, and we start living like Jesus, then we start presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's living like Jesus. And when we've presented ourselves as a living sacrifice, I love, and I'm not going to preach much about it today, but I love verse 1. It ends with that, with that line that says, which is your reasonable service. Our, our problem is that when we get to the place that we start presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, we become obedient God. We want everybody to pat us on the back. It ain't nothing special. It's just reasonable. God gave you everything. You should give him everything. That's just reasonable. It says, but then verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here's where I get following the Holy Spirit from that. When I become obedient to God and I give myself to God the way Christ gave himself to the Father, then all of a sudden, I have the choice. Am I going to think like the world or am I going to think like God? Am I going to do what I think is best or am I going to follow the Holy Spirit and let God lead me into righteousness? Let God lead me into understanding. Let God, let the Holy Spirit be my comforter. Let the Holy Ghost be my guide. See, I've come by here today, church. When we are transformed by renewing our mind and we don't listen to ourselves anymore. I'm, I don't know about you, but I can tell you about me. When I listen to myself, I get in trouble. When I listen to myself, I usually mess up. I am notorious. Well, you know what? If with this and that and this will happen, and if I try to make it happen the way I think it should happen, it never works out right. I can tell you, we, I was just talking about our finances. The reason we were in such a mess financially is because over and over and over again, I told myself that if we bought one more car, it'd take care of it on credit. We, buy, we go into debt for, for one more thing. If I, if I use that credit card for one more thing, that's all I need it for. And before I knew it, every credit card I had was maxed out. Why? Because I was using my head. But when I roll and I start renewing my mind to think like Christ, to follow his word, to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, I began to find out what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Everybody asked me, what does God want me to do? I don't know. Ask him. I got a newsflash for most of, you, most of you. Some of you understand this already. Some of you might not. I'm not God. I'm glad my wife and kids not in here today. I'm not God. 
I'm just like you. But when we love God with all of our heart, and we live like Jesus, not my will, but thy will be done, then our mind gets renewed and we begin to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And what happens? We come to prove and know what is the good and acceptable will of God. He begins to lead us down the path. He begins to show us our steps. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. A righteous man. That means somebody that loves him, follows Jesus, follows the Holy Spirit. We get, now, we're righteous. God begins to direct our steps. He puts us where we need to be. He tells us what we need to say. He shows us what we need to do. He tells us when to say yes, and he tells us when to say no. He tells us when to stand up, and he tells us when to bow down. But until we know, until we reach out to follow him, we're always wondering, what is the will of God? So now we've loved God. We live like Jesus. We follow the Holy Spirit. You want us to serve the world? Now, now I, I want you to be very clear here, and I think this should be obvious. I'm not talking about serving the world as in worshiping the world. I'm talking about serving the world as if you're their waiter. Why would we do that? Because Jesus did. It goes back to living like Jesus because the Holy Spirit tells us to. Because, because loving God, God is love. He doesn't hate people. We shouldn't hate people. We have to serve the world. We've got to serve the world. We've got to find ways to be in service to the world. Mark chapter, chapter 1. I love this story. Chapter 1, verse 30, it says, But Simon's wife, that's Peter, but Simon's wife, excuse me, Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him, capital H, that's Jesus, about her at once. I'm going to stop there before I go on. Peter comes in. He's just found Christ. His mother-in-law's sick. Peter don't know whether to shout or tell Jesus. And, and he tells Jesus, and verse 31, so he, Jesus, came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He, he come in, and, and just by taking her by hand, lifting her up, he healed her. But look the, what the first thing she did when she got her healing. And she served them. Now I want you to see, it doesn't say she served him. See, that's some of our problem. Oh, well, God touched me, and I'm going to serve him, and I'll do anything for Christ, but I ain't doing nothing for you. No, she got up and served them. You know what happens when you serve somebody? You put them first, and you second. Church, it's high time we quit putting ourselves first. We put them first and ourselves second. She served. Now I get news for you. God has touched your life. God has done something in your life that has caused you to understand that you need to love him. You need to live like Jesus. You follow in the Holy Spirit. And now the natural result of that after you've done that, is to get up and begin to serve the world. Begin to serve the world. Why? Because we want to show them the love. You want to know one of the main reasons I ever got saved? I've given you my testimony about God changing my life and how I was a liar and, and how that I faked church. I, I played the game. I grew up in the church, and, and most of you have heard, I, I knew when I was supposed to raise my hands, and I knew when I was supposed to cry, and I knew that you got saved on the last night of youth camp. Never get saved before the last night of camp because you can't have as much fun. That's, that was way, you know, that's the way I always learned it. But, but I, I knew all those games. But one day, God got a hold of me and changed my life. But you want to know one of the things that led to that? My dad sat me down one day, 
And I don't remember. I'd probably been caught in a lie. Something probably happened. And my dad said something that I never thought I'd hear him say, not just as my dad, but as as a church of God ordained bishop in the church of God, as a, as, as, a, as a man of God, I never thought I'd hear him say this. But he sat, down, he sat me down one day and he says, Tommy, I want you to understand something. You're my son, and I love you. And I will love you if you serve God, and I'll love you if you're a sinner. Tommy, if you killed somebody, I'd still love you. If you went out and became a drug addict, drug addict I would still love you because you're my son and I love you. And for a teenage boy to see a picture of my father serving me with love, telling me it didn't matter, didn't matter what I did, didn't matter if I looked like him. It didn't matter if I acted like him. It didn't matter if I, if I did the things he did. He was going to love me. It was, it was that picture of God's love. In a time where I wasn't living right. That showed me that I could give myself to that kind of love. We live in a day and age where too much of the church spends too much of their time pointing out the sins of the sinner. How? I almost said stupid. That's not a nice word. How unrealistic. If you can't point out the sins of a sinner, you must be blind. I got news for you. Most sinners know they've got sin. You know what they need? They need you to point out the love of God. We know they've got to do something. We know they've got to change. We know they need to commit themselves to God. But they're not there yet, so let's love them. Let's show them hope. Let's show them we care. What would happen if the church really became the church? What would happen if we really took on this idea of serving the world? And instead of people going, well, I ain't going to that church. They're a bunch of hypocrites. Which I got news for you, they're right. When we walk in the church and we raise our hands and we shout hallelujah and we shout the victory, and, and as I said earlier, we go home and we tear apart everything that happened at church and we talk about everybody and we talk about who we don't like and who we don't, why would you want to come to that church either? You want to know why I make statements like I did a while ago and said if you don't like it, you can leave? Because all you're going to do is stand as a barrier to growth. We can't put God in people if you're sitting there taking God out of people. It doesn't work. But the world looks at the church and that's what they see. They see us gossiping. They see us talking. They see us getting angry at Walmart. Don't talk about me. They see us honking the horns in our cars. They, 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 they see us mistreating people. They see us becoming arrogant Christians. I'm a Christian. I don't do that. And they think, why in the world would we want to be a part of that? But you know what? When we start showing them love, we start showing them compassion, we start reaching into their lives and saying, Hey, I just love you. I love you. We, we, start, we start just telling them what God's done for us. Telling our story. It's not about, not about telling what they need. It's telling what God's done for me. Oh, man, I, I, I know how you feel. I, I've hurt like that before. But you know what? I, I found God. And God... I can't explain it, but he did something in my life. And, and, and I'm not trying to beat you over the head, but I'm just telling you, I know somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. It will change your life. You'll be amazed how many people listen to that. 
I was talking to a young lady this morning, Sunday school. And, and I was talking to some other people before church about her. Young lady in our church. Pretty quiet. Most people know her. Most people don't know much about her. But I can tell you there's four or five new families in our church. It can be directly connected to her. You know why? I was telling, I was bragging to her about bragging on her to her. Man, you're, you're awesome at this. She says, all I do is tell people, I found a church. And how much I love my church. And how much I, I love the people and how good they are. And, and people just keep coming. You know what she's doing? She's serving the world. She's out there giving them hope. She's out there. She's out there saying, look, I know what it's like to hurt. But a little while back, I fell in love with God. And I started living like Jesus. Now the Holy Spirit guides my steps. And, and now I can tell you, there's something better for your life. Church, if we're going to go back to the basics in this body of believers, we first have got to grab a hold of the presence of God. We've got to grab a hold of the presence of God. We've got to immerse ourselves in the Word of God. It's not easy, but we've got to do it. We've got to find that communication of prayer daily but we got to go back and remember our purpose we're here to love God we're here you know loving God that's a lot like finding the presence of God when you love God you love the presence of God we're here to live like Jesus getting into his words getting into his life understanding his direction following the Holy Spirit as we pray, the Spirit guides us. And then our purpose ultimately comes down to take all of that love, life, and obedience and serve the world. Show people a God that really cares. Show people a God that is concerned for them. Show people a God that wants to change them. I want to leave the adults with the same challenge that I left the kids with this morning. Yeah, I want you to love God. I want you to live like Jesus. I want you to follow the Holy Spirit, but I want you to find this week somebody to serve. Maybe it's buying somebody a meal. Maybe it's inviting somebody to church. Maybe it's offering to pray. Statistics tell us 85% of people are more than likely, that's the word they use, more than likely to attend church if you'll just ask. Serve somebody. Do something for somebody. Make a dessert for somebody. Make a, you know, take, take a, a, a gift to somebody for no reason. Find a way to serve. Because when you find a way to serve others, you're walking in the purpose of our church. Because we're here to love God, live like Jesus, follow the Holy Spirit, and serve the world. Let's bow our heads in prayer.